We continue with the program. It's my uh, great joy to invite Father Stephen to join us here and uh, gives his paper. Father uh, Stephen is an anthropologist by training uh, and uh, having experience like a 50 years as an Orthodox priest and uh, inspired by uh, uh, both Saint Maximus the Confessor and Saint Justin the New. He will present his paper on providence or the, the, the title, exact title is uh, Saint Justin on providence sources and consequences. Please. I thank you for inviting me. I really don't belong here. I am not a theologian. I am not a philosopher, as was just said. I'm some kind of social anthropologist who work most of my life in Asia. But there's no point in making excuses. I'm attracted to uh, St. Justin's thought, and especially his thought on providence. And this modest paper is my personal understanding of what I read. I'm limited to the three volumes of the dogmatics, which exist in French, and to the commentaries of the epistles of St. John, which exists in English. St. Justin is faithful to the Church Fathers, to Irenaeus, who had fought against Gnostic cosmology by defining Christ's cosmic liturgy as anacaphalosis, recapitulation of the cosmos created ex nihilo. To St. Maximus, who showed us how the Logos is the mediator, thus in his Ambigua and later in his Athalassium, St. Maximus presents the Logoi of creation as grounding the Creator's will to de deifying the cosmos by our Logos. And for me, it's very important in English to translate Logos by our reason for being. By our Logos, um, the divine Logos models us into a coexistence of intelligent soul and material body. Creation is related to deification because of God's providence, which discloses the mystery hidden before all ages, Colossians 1.16. The judgment of our human condition in Ambiguous 7 and in Ambiguous 8, St. Maximus allows that to understand how providence can operate in a fallen, fallen world is to penetrate the mystery of embodiment, which provides a teleological partnership for the soul to commune with God. St. Justin owes to St. Isaac the Syrian an ascetical discourse to which I'm very sensitive. Counseling abandoning oneself to God's providence, he recalls Christ's commandment, seek first of all the kingdom of God and its justice, and all these things will be given to you even before you ask of them. Now my first point concerns how I understand what St. Justin is saying when he says providence is in God. For it is God who allows the world to exist. For St. Justin, our first duty, and the first duty of the church with a small c, is to purify itself in, not, in order not to befoul the revelations, the truths which were confided to it. Faith and the piety of reason, says St. Athanasius the Great, who is cited by St. Justin. St. Justin was so aware of this patristic heritage that he chose to describe God's providence by saying as close as possible to the Holy Scripture, hence his affection for the exegesis of St. John Chrysostom's abundant commentary on the Bible. Throughout the Orthodox philosophy of truth, St. Justin proves himself a very careful reader of St. John Chrysostom. He follows his confidence in God's love. His strong faith in providence remind us, reminds us of St. Justin's. But rather than further exploring St. Justin's encyclopedic and admirable knowledge of scripture, I will explore briefly his style of theologizing, how St. Justin wrote on God in his providence. The fact that I'm not reading from the original Serbian should not, I hope, lead to misunderstandings. St. Justin's voice, his way of progressively insisting on what others might find initially obvious, which is in fact a ploy on those to refuse to meditate on the truth, 
is entrancing. Despite the highly structured organization of these volumes, they often contain a quasi-oral, liturgical style of speaking that expresses the strength of his faith and strengthens our own as we patiently sit at his feet and listen. Even the title is intriguing. God in his providence suggests that in God, in God's care, Pranoya, is deployed each and every episode of human history. Indeed, St. Justin says that divine providence is a continual, unending act of God's wisdom. Goodness and love guide and maintain his creatures, limiting their ability to do evil. How so? God foresees evil, tolerates it, and to the extent that it is possible, turns it towards a higher good. For as the Credo sets out in the first phrase, God the Father is almighty. For our monk, this has immediate consequences. All that is visible in this world and all that is invisible is constantly governed by his providence. If we were to live daily with such a strong faith, would we not be less anxious? Or as the Desert of Fathers put it more radically, only by leaving and detaching oneself from this world can one escape the anxieties it imposes and bring in a perspective of grace. Now, I won't cite the passages from mainly volume two, but also volume one, which I'm using because my references to the French translation that's of no use to you whatsoever. Um, just as God is one and indivisible, so is his providence one. This prevents us from slicing life into single episodes that we qualify as lucky, fortunate, blessed, tragic. All moments are blessed by God's conservation, synthesis, of the world. Conservation is that divine wisdom by which God preserves the world he created through time. Such preser <coughs> preservation, St. Justin distinguishes analytically from the direction that God gives to the world in order that it arrive to its own and proper end. God's love, his Trinitarian providence, watches over all and every. Providence is simple. The individual act, the indivisible act of God whereby all creation and not just aspects of it are cared for. The totality of the world is embraced, as St. Justin puts it, from the angel to the gnat, from the galaxy to the atom. Grounding his, thought, his thoughts in Catena of scripture, successive citations is one of St. Justin's style of writing. As dense as a similar trope in liturgical hymnography, one can almost feel the citations appearing in his mind as he meditates on what providence is. Read through slowly, despite their familiarity, we enter the vortex of his reflection. Here is one abbreviated example of, of such a florilege. God fills both heaven and earth, Jeremiah. Heaven is his throne and the earth is the footstool of his feet, St. Matthew. He restrains all by his force, Hebrews. He gives life to all, 1 Timothy. He observes all his creatures, for he commands his son and illumines both the good and the bad, St. Matthew. All subsists in him, Colossians 1. In his hand is found the soul of all beings and the breadth of all men. Well, when I read that last says I couldn't help but recall the, the fresco of the, the souls in the hands of God. Maybe you've seen it in the Georgian church in Jerusalem. It's very popular today in Moscow. I, I have some place. Uh, yeah. You cannot see it from so far away, but it's that. <laughs> and it's, it's such a beautiful uh, fresco. If nothing exists outside of God, if all comes from him, by him, so also scripture is not to be studied only by philology, textual criticism, but primarily by our ability to receive it, to hear it, and then to feel it. If we know that St. Justin read, we know that St. Justin read carefully, St. Maximus the Confessor, for whom true being is not what is inside history, but in that field of not yet being, quote unquote, the object of God's providence, Actually, the not yet being is in the title of the recent book by Dionysius, with whom we just heard, On the Road to Being, St. Maximus, the Confessor's Synodical Ontology. Not yet being. Reading St. Maximus' Mystagogy on the Divine Liturgy, 
I, for one, discovered that it is through verbal icons and iconic words that in liturgy, pardon me, that uh, liturgy transfigures the whole world. I won't develop this, but for me it's very important. I wrote a paper in, which was published in 2016 on mystagogy, where I deal with Maximus's use in his mystagogy of these terms, iconic words and verbal icons. This is implicit, I believe, in St. Justin's understanding of latent existence obtainable through faith. St. Paul wrote famously in Romans 8, creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation is groaning in travail until now. My second point, um, still considered, of course, providence, but it's concerned with the way providence fits with an ascetical Christology. Created beings are the object of natural contemplation, where God reveals himself. Now, to understand this, I use a metaphor you might not appreciate, but for me, my maker has left his fingerprints all over my logos, all over my being. So any aspect of my existence which I examine will somehow return me, refer me back to my creator, and for this I use the metaphor of fingerprints. <clears throat> his fingerprints on, are on all his creatures. This logos of created being is analogous to the logos in Christ. Thus logikos means participation in the logos. For Maximus, grasping the reason for our being, our logos requires an ascetical struggle in response to God's self-emptying. Although God is separate from everything in created order, he desires that the true logoi of everything unite to him. To celebrate the divine liturgy with true humility is the highest cosmic expression on earth of God's providence. Thus the interior mission of the church is to purify itself, to clean the altar of its hearts, so that this may be accomplished by God. Providence through man's maturation under grace, unless evil makes him lose his way, God gives me a reason for my being, a logos, that is protological. As we enter more deeply into the thought of Maximus, we begin to understand how Christ manifests the purpose for which man was created, deified, while preserving man in his natural makeup. The incarnation holds the secrets of the architectural logoi of the created cosmos, as St. Paul tells us in First Colossians, which I'll read just because it's always, it's always nice to hear it who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the being, the firstborn, from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleases the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. By affirming that nothing exists outside of God, without God, but rather that in him, in an unspeakable, ineffable providence of his love, St. Justin leads us to feel the dependence which arises out of being created out of nothing, ex nihilo. And what is our goal? That God be all in all. The providence of his love, we are led to feel, in the providence of his love, we are led to feel that created out of nothing, while God has remained in the world of his creation with us, while Holy Scripture is at once the annals of the past intervention of God's God in history, God totally above the world is through his direction allowing us to approach our end, telos, 
That is to say, again, our reason for being. It is perhaps not necessary to point how different St. Justin's way of writing theology is from the broadly contemporaneous dogmatics of Paniagos Trembelis, whose writing is dogmatic in the sense of affirmative and not nearly as grounded in the experience of scripture. It's I who say that. While one does not sense that St. Justin is trying to be persuasive, it is because he himself is persuaded by the words of God that he avoids excessive aff affirmations while at the same time remaining dogmatic. In this sense, Popovich is more traditional, paradosis, in the etymological sense, whereas receiving a gift from another, allowing us to see how one can receive the teaching of the fathers, which he had led him to the privilege of receiving life in God. By holy tradition, divine authenticity is expressed in the body of Christ, the church. This is my second theme. Writing on the resurrection of the dead, it's basically 30 pages in the section on soteriology in volume two. Writing on the resurrection of the dead, St. Athenagoras of Alexandria said, and this is quoted by St. Uh, Justin, every creature in general needs the providence of his creator. The universe is illuminated by his pronoia as the good logos of the good father. He disposes the order of the universe, enjoys contraries to contraries in order to make a complete harmony. For St. Justin, instead of returning to the abyss of nothing, the good God lets no thing intoxicate itself and exalt itself above its own nature. God holds all back through his word. He retains and embraces all in himself, leaving nothing without his energies. The wisdom of God, the word of God, seizes the universe like a harp to produce beauty and harmony, having created a single world and a single order in the word from which such, in a word, from such varied beings, absolutely nothing is left to chance. How must the church purify itself? Even though man was created in the image and resemblance of God, he is not autonomous, nor has he <coughs> to abandon himself to his own devices. Indeed, his spontaneous nostalgia for his creator induces man to take providence as his guide. Paradise was created for man and the tree of life was planted in the middle for man. The evil that was to weaken man's spiritual strength by destroying his respect for God's will and God's love, God's punishment, his providential banishing of Adam from, from Eden, is in fact to put a limit to the sin in man by death. St. Cyril of Alexandria, whom St. Justin quotes from On the Incarnation of the Lord, shows how by joining death to sin, God in his mercy opened the way for man's resurrection, his salvation. Here begins one another of St. Justin's quasi hymnographic scriptural florilege with 16 citations showing how God cares for each man, liberated from the sickness of sin, putting an end to physical pain, as St. Gregory the Theologian has said. St. Justin invokes with a multitude of citation the patristic understanding of our guardian angels who aid God in his acts of divine providence. Is there a political theology in the writings of St. Justin on providence? Bogdan has recently shown how St. Justin refuses the devolution of European humanism in the name of theohumanism. We are to work towards the incarnate God and all the divine perfections in man and mankind in person and society. The hearts of kings and rulers are in God's hands. He both rewards them with peace and prosperity or punishes them with hunger and death. Quoting St. John Damason, <coughs> St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory the Theologian, the Blessed Augustine, Theodoret and St. John Keshen, uh, St. Justin Popovich, who lived through the horrors of the 20th century, has no hesitation in affirming as God wills, empires rise and fall, but this is hidden from man even as God gives to each community its guardian angel. St. Justin, volume two of his dogmatics, inserts 
this theme of providence into the sequence of chapters on soteriology. Jesus Christ as the Savior in his incarnation, his baptism, his transfiguration, passion and the mystery of his descent into hell. And it's on this last theme that I want to end. It seems to me that the web, the, the width, pardon me, it seems to me that the width and the dip, his, and depth of his project demands from the outset a clearly defined organization of material in order to avoid repetitions and speaking about all things at the same time. But the theme of Christ's descent into hell is so dramatic that it is almost unique. Now, I enrich my reading of this by a recent book by Metropolitan Ilarian Alefeyev, Christ the Conqueror of Hell, The Descent into Hell from an Orthodox Perspective, 2009, because uh, I am an ardent reader of St. Ephraim, but I don't know Syriac, and Metropolitan Ilarian introduces texts we'd never read before in translation in Western European language from St. Ephraim to show you how important that the theme of Descent into Hell is in the early Syriac Fathers. This is also true of the earliest uh, hymnographers writing in Greek, but all whom, whom know Syriac, St. John Damison, St. Cosmos, St. Uh, Andrew of Crete, and St. Ramasamad, all grew up in the Syriac-speaking milieu, and therefore had been familiar with this de these developments. Nothing can be more providential for all those who preceded the coming of Messiah than is the center to hell that in a temporal perspective. Nothing could evoke more strongly Christ's condescendence than his incarnation leading to the cross and his abasement to gather those in Sheol where hope had been obscured by the shadow of death. St. Justin says that the issue here is not framed by a past, a present or a future. For Christ in his divine and human nature, his typostatic union, is a mystery hidden from all eternity while it reveals eternal life. For yesterday and today, Jesus Christ is the same, and he will be always, Hebrews 13. And the Father has not exercised <coughs> his providence only towards those who lived in the times of Caesar Siberius, but also, said Propter Amnes Amino Omines, who feared God from the beginning, who had loved him, who had behaved with justice and piety towards their neighbor, and who desired to see Christ and hear his voice. This is in the section, volume two. For St. Justin Christ's ascent into hell is a constitutive part of the economy of salvation of the human race. Even as it appears a mystery which holy tradition interprets from holy scripture to the extent and only to the extent that it is necessary for our spiritual lucidity and for our salvation. After the prophecy of St. John the Baptist, which preceded Christ descending to hell, St. Peter is our first discreet New Testament witness. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. 1 Peter 4, 6. For this is the cause, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that thy may be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And of course, St. Paul in Ephesians 4. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up unto high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, for these two citations which St. Justin uses, he deduces two consequences. When and how Christ descended into hell. Secondly, what Christ proclaimed in hell. As always, his logical mind does not limit its piety, for he immediately adds, for in his life as in his death, Christ the Lord appears as true man. His death, like the death of all men in general, consists in the separation of the soul and the body. But his soul 
even as it is separated from his body, remains hypostatically united to his divinity. So also, for his body, which although separated from his soul, remains hypostatically united to his divinity. At this point, St. Justin cites the prayer which every priest uses all the time at the end of the proscomedia or during the liturgy, as he censors the four sides of the altar, and I quote, in the tomb bodily, in hell with your soul is God, in paradise with the good thief, you are seated on the throne with the Father and the Spirit of Christ, who fills all things and whom none can contain. I'll stop here, for we have seen that St. Justin's theology is always prayerful. One, whether considering the great mystery of his descent into hell, or more generally, how he characterizes God's providence, not scholastically as one of his attributes, but as the ex incessant expression of his love for mankind, the light of God's revelation and the orthodox faith, mankind, pardon me, in the light of God's revelation and the orthodox faith, mankind is a community, mankind is a communion and not a society. Founded by his love for his creation, each person was created by him for eternal life in his kingdom. Such should be our awareness of Christ's providence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Stephen. Now we open the floor for questions. Please. Well, I, 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 well, my, my, my question will be a bit longer and it connected with Maximus and if somebody else has something. Because it's very interesting. That, well, thank you very much for, because uh, you notice this uh, 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 link between Maximus and, and Justin, and it's not something obvious in his work. You can see that uh, uh, he has much, more other uh, fathers who, whom he quotes, starting with uh, John Chrysostom and everything, but deeply I think that he was uh, uh, influenced by Justin. And uh, uh, the whole language of him, like using logos, and the term, I don't know whether, or logosity, there's a, uh, actually points that he's uh, understanding. Now, when it comes, you, you probably know that in, in St. Maximus, there's a kind of very complex kind of tree or system of different logoi. <laughs> and then uh, you can distinguish, uh, let's say, on this kind of cosmic level, uh, logoi of being, logoi of providence, mm -hmm. and logoi of judgment. Mm -hmm. Logoi of being there, uh, like a God is, because God is creator, God is provider, and God is the judge. And for this reason, there are like a three types of logoi. Now, God continues, even after the creation, God continues to create. It means that the beings which will come to existence will uh, come by cr his creative power. You know. Now, I'm curious what, how you, you uh, like, a, because a logosity uh, mean like, a, I, I, I had a, a difficulty to translate Mother Maria rule, try to, to help me, uh, becoming, the logos, but if you translate logos with reason of being, this is going to becoming aware of your reason of being or something mm -hmm. like. Now, uh, what is because then it's your own personal thing. In which way God providence actually acts in this uh, through your mind, through your soul, how you see like a physically or, or through Eucharist or because normally you have this two I just like to bring you you have like a two like a, a garden man garden human being it's a communication on two levels one is level uh, level plane from coming from God to to human and one from human to God God uh, communicates with human being and humanity through uh, Holy mysteries, holy sacraments. That's the way 
for this reason he doesn't take like hierarchy is important but not as that important because actually what they do is helping God to be revealed through the sacraments and the, the way uh, human being is communicating uh, uh, with God is through holy virtues like holy virtues 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 yeah. yeah and like you have to 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 carry virtuous life and then and this is the only way to become like a, uh, to uh, uh, you achieve the likeness with this Christ as ontological virtue. Now, how you will see because this way of, of providence where is uh, actually happening? Well, I'm very happy to be corrected. For me, the ascetical Christology about which Saint Justin talks implies that an important dimension of grace is the acrisis, discernment. And so God gives me, no matter how low I've fallen, the discernment of where I am and how much space I'm separated from God. I mean, what is the meaning of the word sin other than all that separates me from God? That's what sin is about. And God gives me through his grace and in a very independent, free way. I mean, I cannot, I'm not obliged to receive his grace, but if I receive it, then I have the discernment of that which separates me from God. God and therefore the the ascetics uh, of the Christology of the Kenosis becomes uh, like a stepladder, you know, and slowly. And uh, Saint John Climacus allows that on the ladder of ascent you can fall several rungs, but then you begin again and you maybe go a little bit higher. And um, I'm not terribly sensitive to what troubles you. <laughs> I, I I find that uh, Saint Justin speaks it in fairly easy to understand terms except what I said already once which is for me that logos my logos should be translated as my reason for being that makes sense to me maybe that's not the best translation but for me I, I need to know what is my meaning for being I may have values which I've betrayed but nonetheless uh, there should be some fundamental root which justifies my existence which I've received from God created ex nihilo no? For me, that, that's sufficient, but maybe that's uh, a personal understanding of Maximus. You know, but when you're Maximus, you're Maximus you're, uh, again, you have this, this three logoi. You have logos, mm -hmm. logos of being, logos mm -hmm. of well-being, and logos of eternal being. Eternal well-being, yeah. Eternal well -being. being. Well being. And uh, yeah. eternal well-being is something yeah. you can be eternal ill-being. But eternal being is something given to you as logos, as being. Mm -hmm. You know, you have being and eternal being. This is gift from God. You have the, 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 the meat, like you have to achieve, whether you have to direct yourself, whether you will achieve well-being or ill-being. It means that the, 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 it depends on you, uh, whether your well-being gives you, uh, leads you to eternal well-being and in this sense it's a cooperation I being is given to me I have to make my being good in order to receive eternity now in my in in, in Justin you have a logosity okay because is this kind of somebody this sermon being aware where you are or also include certain things and then actually you receive this gift from God as well be eternal well-being or something this is something what I'm trying to to fit how he reads this how, how you understand that he reads Maximus I, I evacuate terminologies jargon that I don't immediately relate to okay okay uh, good. Uh, any, uh, okay any mm -hmm. I sometimes find in popular piety um, things that should speak to me I'm going to meet my maker as a man dies. I'm going to meet my maker. That's a very deep theological statement. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't need to talk about well-being, eternal well-being. And, I, and um, no, it's, um, if I'm not wrong. Almost everything that St. Maximus wrote cannot be read as text. There were things that should be read in a group of people, an elder to help explain what he means by this and that. I mean, I've tried to read that with people who know St. Maximus very well, and I found that they knew so much more than I did that the text immediately took page five, six pages to, to explain. Um, and uh, that's a way of writing. 
also the Desert Fathers in a different context. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think we should all read St. Max's, but very freely pull out those things which speak to us. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, uh, Vladimir, are you trying to grapple with the... Uh, thank you, Father, it's very helpful. Are you trying to grapple with uh, the Maximian implications of orlogosity? Yes. Um, right, I see. Yeah. It's a very fair question. Yeah, that's, that, and I don't uh, think it's... Uh, uh, forgive me. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's trivial at all. Yeah. But your answer is very, very uh, good, I think, also. It's something you, you, we need to open up. It's not, it's not that obvious, actually. But one thing which is very exciting, and I think you were very, uh, that's one of your very important contributions, is to, to discer discern, find uh, the Maximian context of Justin's insistence of the, of the uh, Logos narrative, terminology, symbology, conceptuality. He insists on the term Logos, there's no doubt about it and on the energies, the Logoi as well. Mm -hmm. He speaks of, we've heard this morning, that he, there's not one sermon of just St. Justin's in which the, the uh, terms eternal energies... Eternal justice, eternal love. No, no, I said eternal. I said, didn't say internal. I said, you said that there's not one sermon in which we will not find a reference to the eternal divine energies. The, yeah. Yeah, so this goes even further to illustrate how important this is. And I do think uh, that it can all come out of the God-man theology, uh, as of the Logos, the second hypostasis, or the, the Logos of the pre-eternal Father come incarnate in Christ. I think it can have uh, a sort of connection with the, with the Logos theology in its um, outworking from Maxim, who is very well in touch with all the previous Logos fathers, fathers of the Logos. But I think that's a that's a subject for a paper in its own right. It's, it would, and I wouldn't be surprised if you could show, and if you do show, that actually all the three types of modes, tropoi of the Logoi, which you've referred to, the, crea the creative, the su supplicative, providing, providential, and the ju judging mm -hmm. aspects of, or I'd, I'd rather say modes of the Logoi, mm -hmm. Because I can't just see one. I don't. See, I don't read Maximus as if he separates the logoi in a strict. No, the three types. They are not exactly. No, no, no. All no, the way out of each the other. They, they are jointed with the nervature yeah, yeah. of the of the general um, kind of unity in the one something. logos. Yeah, 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 because it's from the one logos. They can't be apart. They are not. This. They're connected, but. Mm. They are not the same, but they are connected. Anyhow, if, if I think it's a little bit more. I think would it's, you please translate yeah. some of the sermons of St. Justin into English so we can <coughs> see how he manages to explain them to a more general audience? Okay. May I may I uh, may I yeah, pick on that, pick up on that and yeah. ask kindly both of you to allow me to propose to Father Lyubisha, who has um, uh, enriched us this morning with this discovery to uh, cooperate by sending a selection of those sermons he thinks will be the most adequate for what you des and we desire. And if it's not unmodest from my side, I volunteer to translate uh, uh, a selection of, of the sermons into um, English. Of, un under the condition that, that uh, colleague Tsvetkovic doesn't mind, and that Father Phillips, perhaps, uh, Father Stephen, perhaps does the proof, the stylistic and syntactic proofreading. So, yeah. in that case, what do you think? Good idea. Yeah. And then you write a, a preface with a, a colleague Ted Kuch or separately, so that you can introduce us into the yeah, yeah, we'll into this idea. I think there are also more volunteers who will be willing to help with this thing. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, good. So, fine, uh, just somebody, let us not forget this. I let, think, yeah, yeah, I yeah, think this is great. also a fact of this conference. Thank you very much, Father so, Stephen, thank you. Thank you.